Good afternoon, gentlemen. Anderson, why don't you say hello to our mayor, Mr. Tillman, here. How do you do, Anderson? Mr. Mayor, Mr. Barber. Well, this looks like the place to be, even for me. <laughs> yeah. Nothing like a barber shop for a jaw on your socks off. Where are you from, anyway, Anderson? Thornton, Mississippi, sir. Just as fit from Tennessee. Well, then you must know how we all feel down here. We don't take the outsiders telling us how to live our lives. And I'm here to tell you, our we're happy until those beatnik college kids came down here staring things up. Before that, there wasn't anybody complaining. <laughs> Nobody dared. <laughs> I'm just down here to investigate the missing three kids, ask some questions. Them kids you're looking for, I just about bet you a shiny new dime. They're setting up in Chicago right now, drinking a cold beer and having a big laugh about all the commotion they've stared up down here. Well, I sure hope so. Simple fact is, Anderson, we got two cultures down here. White culture and the colored culture. Now that's the way it always has been. That's the way it always will be. What's the score, Mr. Barber? St. Louis on top, five to nothing. What inning is it? Bottom of the seventh. You like baseball, do you, Anderson? Yeah, I do. You know, it's the only time when a black man can wave a stick at a white man and not start a riot. Today is a bit of a history lesson, but don't worry, we're going to do it Kim style, so it shouldn't be boring. It's also the history of something that I have a very deep interest in since I read To Kill a Mockingbird when I was about mm, 9 or 10, the Civil Rights Movement. If you are much younger than me, then you might not actually know much of the history in America's South. So today I'm going to fill you in by telling you the true story behind one of my favorite movies of all time, Mississippi Burning. This is the murders of Michael Schwerner, Andrew Goodman, and James Cheney. First of all, let me be clear, genocides and civil rights violations and prejudices and all that terrible stuff happen or have happened in most countries against one group of people or another. So this is definitely not an anti-American episode. Believe me, Canada's got its own rough history of inflicting pain and trauma on people. And the enslavement of Africans wasn't just an American thing. Slavery itself dates back to about 3500 BC with the Mesopotamians, and Portugal was the first country to capture people from West Africa as slaves. But we're not really going back that far. I think even you youngins are likely aware that America engaged in the slave trade back in the day. And if you didn't know that, put on your Google pants and get Googling because it's history everybody should know about. The part that we're going to get to wasn't actually that long ago, and I think that's the part that should shock and dismay everyone. So just to gloss over this, the end of the Civil War in 1865 put an end to slavery and the beginning of emancipation for former African slaves in the U.S., and then everything was good and people were all treated equally. The end, only not so much. We have a good set of figures here, and they don't want to be disturbed. They really are. I have one that I just love. She nursed my children for about six years. Although it was now illegal to own a person as a slave, white prejudice was still very much there, particularly in the southern states where they had fought hard to keep their slaves. (laughs) Mrs. J.D. Milan, and I think this is the most ridiculous thing that has ever happened. The Negroes are just as free as we are. They have the same opportunity to work and to build their part of the town up just the same as we have. I, I just don't understand it and don't approve of it. I'm going to stand up for my rights. Thank you very much. Jim Knight with WALB Television News. Mm-hmm. We're soliciting the views of Albany people on the Civil Rights Bill. Would you like to give us your views? Well, I think if they remain peaceful, it would be a lot better than perhaps the violence that would be concerned. Uh, well, of course, being a southerner, I'm not for it at all. I see. And uh, I just don't know how it's going to turn out. I hope we don't have any trouble. 
We're soliciting opinions on the Civil Rights Bill. Would you like to give us yours? I'm sorry, but I don't think it's the time right now. I think they have equal rights, though. Thank you very much. Would you like to express your views? No, I don't think so. How about you? Nope. What I'd have to say wouldn't be fit to go on air. Thank you very much. I don't like it. I think you're just trying to put something on, on us that we don't want. I see. We ought to have a national election on it rather than just letting nine men tell us what we got to do. And how about you? No, I feel the same. Fine, thank you very much. Well, I sure don't like it, that's for sure. I see. Do you feel this will have any effect on your life directly? I imagine it will. Thank you very I'm much. I'm we might have niggers to live next door to us. Thank you. The bird gets the break and the white man doesn't. For instance, two men, one white and one colored, breaks into a store. Here. In all probability, the colored man would get a very light sentence and the white man would get a heavy sentence. But that's not equality under the law. So in the South, they instituted black codes, which were laws that curtailed people of African descent to own the right to own property. It was also illegal for African Americans to serve on juries or serve in the military. Now, for both my Canadian and American listeners, I need to do some explaining here. In Canada, wherever possible, if for some reason you need to distinguish an ethnicity, you use the term of the region the person is originally from. So if you know that the person is Korean, you say Korean. If you don't know, you can say person of color. Um, We do use the term black here, but we don't have specific black culture. So it's not really correct to use that term here. We also don't attach the word American. So we don't use the term African American. So normally I use the term person of color. However, in the U.S., it's different. I'm going to go with African American because I'm distinguishing those that are direct descendants of African slaves. When referring to people as black, um, when I'm referring to an established community and culture, and when I do use less correct terminology, it is a direct quote or from source material relating to a time period when the terminology was considered correct. So anyways, life in America still sucked for the majority of African Americans, is all that I'm trying to say. The master and the mistress taught the most truthfulness and honesty as they taught their own children by not tempting them and by trusting them. Although technically free, they were still forced to live in poverty, denied an education, and pretty much working for free, exchanging their labor for shabby rentals. However, Republicans at the time wanted to provide land to former slaves. The federal government said no way. Former slaves have never been compensated for their enslavement, which is very sad. Black churches started to become a big part of African American culture and quickly became a place for learning and socializing, and ministers in the black community were leaders. And churches were responsible for starting education institutions like the Fisk and Howard Universities, and from 1865 to 1877 was the period known as Reconstruction. Congress passed laws to provide rights to African Americans in the South, including the 14th Amendment, which uh, which gave all African Americans American citizenship, and the 15th Amendment, which gave African American men the right to vote. In fact, Republicans, in an effort to overcome resistance from white people in the South, placed military troops in southern states to enforce these civil liberties. But it didn't last. In the 1860s came the rise of the KKK, or the Ku Klux Klan, who terrorized African Americans in the South, and by 1871, the military peaced out, and with that, lynchings and segregationist laws took over the South. And in 1877 came something you might have heard of, but not known what exactly it was, Jim Crow. Back in 1830, there was a minstrel routine called Jump Jim Crow, where Thomas Dartmouth portrayed a character called Jim Crow who was a bumbling idiot, and the term Jim Crow became a very derogatory term based on false and negative stereotypes about African Americans. So in their infinite wisdom, Jim Crow laws became the term for a series of statutes that made segregation legal. These laws forbade blacks from riding the same transit, eating in the same restaurants, or even drinking from the same water fountain as Caucasians. The purpose of these laws was to deny African Americans the right to vote, go to school, and basically enjoy or do anything where white people were, and those that didn't obey the rules were arrested and, yes, often lynched. 
which is when a bunch of white people get together and hang someone for the audacity of wanting to be treated as a human being. And then on August 14th in Springfield, Illinois, a mob of about 5,000 angry white folks descended on two black men accused of raping two women and murdering their father. Only when arriving to lynch the men, they found out that the sheriff had moved them out of town, and for two days the angry white mob attacked black neighborhoods and murdered people right out on the streets as retaliation, burning their houses and destroying their businesses. This fiasco inspired the formation of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP. In New York City in 1910, headed by a bunch of white guys and one African-American man determined to fight for the rights of African-Americans. And things pretty much continued to suck, especially in the South, for African-Americans. By the end of the century, segregation was complete. The New South rose out of the ashes of the old. And the good guy was the one who once again knew his place. He's not, the neighbor is not a part of my family. As a result, I don't elect to have him sit and eat with me. As a result, I don't elect to have him belong to a club that I may belong to. And then a guy named Medgar Evers started selling insurance in Mississippi. And while he was at it, organized a new chapter of the NAACP in Mississippi in 1952, a bold move in a place where segregation had pretty much a stronghold. He also applied to attend at the University of Mississippi an even bolder move. He was denied entry on a technicality. Uh, He might have failed at getting into a white law school, but the president of the NAACP was pretty impressed with him and appointed him the position of field secretary of the NAACP. In 1954, when the Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka decision decision declared segregated schools unconstitutional, Mississippians, at least the white ones, lost their mother-loving minds, and all kinds of violence broke out, which continued for about five years. But on the morning of June 12, 1963, Medgar Evans was gunned down and the black community reacted to his assassination by taking to the streets. His death led to the Civil Rights Act in 1964, and Freedom Summer. And Freedom Summer is where today's story begins. Freedom Summer was a term for a voter registration drive to get black voters registered in Mississippi, and it was organized by the Council of Federated Organizations, and one of those organizations was the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, C-O-R-E, as its acronym. At the time, although it was legal for African American men to vote, The locals put up a lot of barriers, like poll taxes that required a $2 payment and African Americans to complete a 21-question registration form and to answer to the satisfaction of the white register a question on any one of the 285 parts of the state's constitution. Even if they could get through that process, there was the issue of whites intimidating and threatening those that dared to try to register to vote. And in preparation of this, more than 1,000 white, mostly university students from out of town from states up north, descended on Mississippi to set up voter registration in black churches and inside the black communities to get rid of these barriers. Let's just say white Mississippians were not pleased. In fact, many of them were so unpleased they started to burn down their own state with burning crosses, lynchings, and just plain unnecessary violence. You see, white Mississippians were worried if the black community voted, they might vote for someone that wanted them to have rights, and what kind of mess would that be? So the project continued for 10 days, and during that time, 1,062 volunteers and locals were arrested. 80 Freedom Summer volunteers were beaten, 37 churches were bombed or burned down, 30 black homes and businesses were burned, 4 civil rights workers were killed, and 3 local African Americans were murdered. And it all started on day one, June 21st, 1964, when James Cheney, an African-American Corps worker local to Mississippi, Andrew Goodman, a white volunteer from Corps, and Michael Schwerner, another volunteer, both of them from New York City and both of Jewish descent, were arrested by the Neshoba County Deputy Sheriff Cecil Price, who, spoiler alert, is also a member of the KKK held in jail, and then released that night and told to get the heck out of town. Only they never arrived back home in New York or anywhere else. So the FBI came looking for them. James Cheney was born to parents Fannie Lee and Ben Cheney in 1943. 
He was a member of the St. Joseph Catholic Church, and he was a very brave soul. At 15, he want, he started wearing an NAACP button to school, and although they were going to a segregated school, he was suspended for that because the principal feared for the reaction of the all-white school board. After finishing school, he began working at a, as, as a plasterer's apprentice and continued to work with civil rights. Participating in the 1962 Freedom Ride from Tennessee to Mississippi, he joined the Congress of Racial Equality Corps in 1963, and just before the Freedom Summer, he met with the minister of the Mount Nebo Baptist Church to encourage them to let Michael Schwerner come and talk about using the church for voter registration. Michael Schwerner was born in Pelham, New York, called Mickey by his friends to Mom Ann and Dad Nathan. He went to Michigan University to become a veterinarian, but switched to Cornell to major in sociology and then went on to Columbia University at the School of Social Work. He led the core group in Manhattan and worked to desegregate the Gwyn Oak Amusement Park in Maryland. He met James Cheney when he was asked to organize the community center in Median, Mississippi. He was also the first organizer of black boycotts in the South called Don't Shop Where You Can't Work. The Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission knew about Michael and kept tabs on him and his activities. Its lead investigator, or spy, was Al Hopkins, and he provided Neshoba County Sheriff Lawrence Rainey with his license plate number to keep an eye on him. Andrew Goodman was born November 23, 1943, in New York City to parents Robert and Carolyn. His mom was a social activist, and he grew up in a racially mixed neighborhood. At 14, he went to Washington to participate in the Youth March for Integrated Schools, and at 17 was part of the sit-in at the New York Woolworths. Andrew was an honor student and went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison as a drama major, but it fell ill and later went to Queens College and majored in anthropology. And in the spring of 1964, he attended a speech by Aaron Henry, the head of New York's NAACP, and started teaching at the core training session for the Freedom Summer volunteers where he met Michael and James. The three of them trained hundreds of volunteers that were setting up out in Mississippi. And while there, Michael found out that the KKK had burned down the the Mount Zion Methodist Church in Philadelphia, Mississippi. And so with that, Michael, James, and Andrew all headed by car on June 20th to Philadelphia, Mississippi to investigate. On June 21st, they arrived in Meriden COFO headquarters and were heading out then to visit the ruins at the church in Longdale. Michael told volunteers if they were not back by four, quote, if we're not back by then, start trying to locate us. At 3 p.m. after visiting the church, they headed back to Meriden. They decided to take the Highway 16 rather than the 491, which was unpaved and a bit too desolate for their liking. Highway 16 would intersect with Philadelphia, and then they would take Highway 19 to Meriden. They knew that they had to be back by four, and an hour's drive should do the trick. Now, there is a bit of a debate over this, but in the most detailed accounts, just after they got through the Philadelphia city limits, they got a flat tire and pulled over. And that's when Deputy Cecil Price pulled up and arrested the three of them. James for speeding, saying he was doing 65 in a 35 zone, which is highly unlikely, seeing that they knew the dangers of being arrested for doing anything, and if they had a flat tire, they weren't driving at all. Anyways, James was charged with speeding, and Michael and Andrew were arrested for investigation. Complete bogus charges, no matter how you look at it. They were taken to the Neshoba County Jail and held there until 10.30 p.m., while unbeknownst to them, a plot involving the KKK was brewing on them. Naturally, when four came and went, the COFO workers started calling around, including calling the Philadelphia Sheriff's Office, who said he hadn't seen them. So they contacted the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover was the big cheese at the FBI uh, at that time, and he wasn't too keen on getting involved in a missing persons case. But President Lyndon Johnson basically ordered him to get his button gear and get looking because this was going to get messy. Two white civil rights workers go missing in the Deep South wasn't good for PR. So Meriden FBI head John Proctor was contacted to start searching for the trio. By that evening, Robert Kennedy, the U.S. Attorney General, ordered 150 FBI agents sent from New Orleans to help with the search. It was two indigenous men that found their car the following morning in the Bogue Chitto Swamp. 
They found the car, but not the men. Despite Walter Cronkite telling CBS news watchers that the disappearances were the focus of the whole country's concern, Sheriff Lawrence Rainey, the one that we will later learn was given the license plate number of the car the men were driving, said, they're just hiding and trying to cause a lot of bad publicity for this part of the state. Now, during the next month or so, while they searched for the bodies of James, Andrew, and Michael, Um, who the FBI were pretty sure were dead. They also found the bodies of Henry D., Charles Moore, two college students that disappeared in May, and 14-year-old Herbert Orsby, as well as five other African Americans who were never identified. The outrage caused by what was happening in Mississippi sparked Lyndon Johnson to pass the Civil Rights Act on July 2nd. It also helped getting the Voting Voting Rights Act of 1965 passed the following summer. 44 days after the three men vanished on August 4th, an informant known as Mr. X, later identified as Maynard King, a highway patrol officer who died in 1966, told FBI agents where the bodies were and they were pulled from a a dam in Old Jolly Farm, owned by 34-year-old Olin Burridge. And as I stand here tonight, thinking about the discovery of these three young men, I think about the fact that it is urgent and it is important for the federal government through the FBI to use all of its resources to discover who killed those men. They have the technical know-how, they have the machinery. And it is my faith that somehow they will discover who committed that dastardly act. But tonight I'm concerned about a deeper question. It's a haunting, poignant question. A question facing everybody under the sound of my voice tonight and every person who lives in this nation is not so much who killed those young men, but what killed them. And when we move from the who to the what, in a strange sense, that death involves all of us. For those of us who have been negligent about trying to register and vote participated in that act. Those men who have been silent when they should have been speaking participated in that act. Michael and Andrew had been shot once in the heart. An autopsy of Andrew revealed red clay in his lungs and clutched in his fists, suggesting he had been buried alive. James was shot three times, severely beaten and castrated. By November 1964, the FBI had traced a conspiracy formed by 21 white men to injure, oppress, threaten, and intimidate the three men. They also had a pretty good idea of who and what led to their murders. Nine men were considered the ones that had, that had put the plan together. Bernard Aiken, a member of the White, white Knights of the KKK. Other Burks, known as Otha, a Philadelphia police officer. Olin Burridge, the owner of the farm where the bodies were found. Edgar Killen, a Baptist preacher and owner of the local sawmill. Frank Herndon, owner of the Meriden Drive-In, he was a grand cyclops of the Meriden White Knights. James Harris, a White Knights investigator, he was assigned to keep tabs on the young men. Oliver Warner, known as Pops, a grocery store owner and member of the KKK. Herman Tucker, not a member of the KKK, but worked for Olin Burridge, he was told to get rid of the men's station wagon. Samuel Bowers, the imperial wizard of the White Knights, a man that said, this is a war between the Klan and the FBI, and in a war there will be some who suffer. This summer, the enemy will launch his final push for victory in Mississippi, and there must be a secondary group of our members standing back from the main area of conflict, armed and ready to move. It must be an extremely swift, extremely violent hit-and-run group. And 10 other men were considered to have been a direct part of the three murders. Deputy Cecil Price, he had no prior experience in law enforcement before being named sheriff. He was only 26 at the time of the murders. Edgar Killen, a KKK organizer. Travis Barnett, owner of of a garage and member of the KKK. 
Alton Roberts, a dishonorably discharged Marine and salesman, six foot three and 270 pounds of ill temper. James Jordan, Jimmy Arledge, Jimmy Snowden, Jerry Sharp, a pulp mill operator, Billy Posey, an auto mechanic, Jimmy Townsend, who was only 17 and a high school dropout working for Posey. And so what happened that fateful night of June 21st was that after releasing the three men into the night and ordering them to head out of town, Cecil got into his 1957 Chevy sedan and followed them, basically an escort to the city limits. They headed south on Highway 19 where they pulled onto the Pilgrim Corner store to use the payphone, but were intimidated by a highway patrol car parked there, so continued on their way towards Meriden. Meanwhile, a mob of angry white supremacists were in Travis and Posey's car drinking and carrying on about who was going to kill who, when other Burks pulled up in his patrol car and told the group, they're going on 19 towards Meriden, follow them. And the eight men in two cars pulled out after Cecil's patrol car that was following the three men in the station wagon. All the men caught up with the trio on road 492 and forced them to turn around and start heading north again. Cecil forced them over to pull over on Rock Cut Road, where they were taken from the station wagon. Alton shot Michael and Andrew, and James Jordan shot James Cheney, who of course was beaten savagely and castrated by the mob before James shot him three times. After being shot, they were loaded back into the station wagon and driven by, I believe, Posey out to Barrage's farm to the pond under construction that housed an earthen dam where they were met by Herman Tucker, who was waiting for them, and the plan had come together earlier that day at Barrage's garage. Tucker used a bulldozer to cover the bodies, and Cecil Price gave a little speech saying, quote, Well, boys, you've done a good job. You struck a blow for the white man. Mississippi can be proud of you. You've let those agitating outsiders know where this state stands. Go home now and forget it. But before you go, I'm looking each one of you in the eye and telling you this. The first man who talks is dead. If anybody knows anything about this ever opens his mouth to any outsider about it, and then the rest of us are going to kill him just as dead as we killed those three son of a bitches tonight. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? The man who talks is dead, dead, dead. Herman then drove the station wagon out onto Highway 21 in Neshoba County and set it on fire. Mississippi prosecutors refused to charge any of the men for murder, which is a state crime. So the federal prosecutor charged the 18 men with Section 242 and 371, conspiring to deprive of civil rights, by way of murder, of course. But on February 24, 1965, federal judge and segregationist William Cox threw out the case, except for the charges against Sheriff Lawrence Rainey and Cecil Price, on the grounds that the other men were not acting under color of state law. But in March 1966, their indictments were reinstated by the U.S. Supreme Court. And the trial of of the U.S. versus Cecil Price et al. started on October 7, 1967, under Judge William Cox, still a segregationist. A jury of seven white men and five white women deadlocked and the judge ordered them to keep going. In the end, seven of the 18 men were convicted, the first convictions ever for killing a civil rights worker. Of the seven were Cecil uh, Cecil Price, Samuel Bowers, Alton Roberts, Jimmy Snowden, Billy Posey, Horace Barton, and Jimmy Arletledge, with sentences ranging from three to seven years. Not one of them ever served more than six years. Edgar Killen was one of the acquitted ones because one juror couldn't bring herself to convict a preacher. In 1999, the state reopened the investigation. The FBI turned over to the state more than 4,000 files pertaining to the case. One of the problems with bringing charges in the 36-year-old case was that many of the key witnesses that testified in the federal case were now dead. Cecil Price died of head injuries in a fall from a lift equipment at a rental store on May 6, 2001. He set back to the ongoing investigation, but before he died, he admitted that he called Billy Billy Posey and asked him to get in touch with Edgar Killen, who planned the murders. In 2004, on the 40th anniversary of the murders, there there was public pressure to reopen the case, and Neshoba County indicted Edgar Killen on three counts of murder. He was convicted of manslaughter and at the ripe age of 80 was sentenced to 60 years in prison. 
He appealed on the grounds that no jury of his peers in 1964 would have ever convicted him. And that was shot down in 2007. And on August 13th, Billy Wayne Posey died at the age of 73. On March 15th, 2013, Olin Burridge died at 82. And in 2016, the Mississippi Attorney General Jim Hood closed the case for good, saying the evidence has been degraded by memory over time. And and so there are no individuals that are living now that we can make a case on at this point. James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner were all awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Barack Obama in 2014. There are memorials to the three civil rights workers at the Miami University, Cedar Springs High School in Michigan, and several in New York, including Queens College, Freedom Place in Manhattan, and Cornell University. In Mississippi, there is a stone memorial at the Mount Nebo Baptist Church and another one at Mount Zion United Methodist Church and at the old Neshoba County Jail. In 1998, Ben Cheney established the James Earl Cheney Foundation to promote civil rights, and James Cheney Drive-In Meriden is named for him. In 2002, Goodman Mountain was named in Tupper Lake, New York after Andrew Goodman, And in 2018, Pelham, New York, named a section of Harmon Avenue as Michael Schwerner Way in his honor.